um, please do feel free to participate fully. But obviously, if you feel like you want to say something and feels like a daft bloody question and you want to do it off screen, then you can always contact me or Neil afterwards as well via Texas. So um, there are lots of opportunities to connect. Don't feel you need to uh, hold anything back. Um, so it's really nice for me to get involved with the Coastal Communities Network again and see some familiar faces and some new ones. Uh, for those that haven't met me before, my name's Hannah Grist. I'm a lecturer in socio environmental systems at SRUC. Um, I'm mainly teaching, but I also do a lot of kind of coastal communities, citizen science work. Um, I ran the Capturing Our Coast project a good few years ago now, if you're trying to place why my face looks familiar from various uh, photos and videos from that project. So this is, oh, this is my um, this is my admission from the beginning in that I do a lot of kind of citizen science and I do mainly coastal work. So I'm not an underwater recording specialist, um, but fortunately I have my colleague here, Neil, who is, and he's going to be here to answer any more kind of technical questions. So between us and between all the knowledge in this room, we can hopefully have a really nice session just thinking about what we're doing, how we can move forward. So we're here to kind of kick off conversations about the um, community led marine biodiversity monitoring methods every time that takes me a little bit of a run up um, and specifically the underwater monitoring. So this is because um, I think people tend to be quite relatively confident maybe with the intertidal and, and the onshore stuff. But once you start getting to the subtitle and offshore, we recognise that there are some challenges, both in terms of purpose and technicality around undertaking it effectively. Um, that different groups at different places and where they're going on this journey. Um, and so really the purpose of this afternoon is to get together to explore some of those shared challenges, explore some of the things you've done right. So we're not reinventing the wheel or having to all get it wrong individually. We can kind of learn from each other a little bit and hopefully a bit of a clear idea moving forward of what it is you can or want to do. All of which means that it is totally fine if you are an expert in underwater monitoring. That's fantastic. You're welcome. Please come and share your expertise. It's also totally fine if you haven't tried it yet. Um, that's what we're here for to kind of kick you off. So what we're going to do is we're going to start um, kind of just touching on some of the basics and then build up to proper large scale geekery. So over the course of the two hours, we'll hopefully go from one to the other and there might be some stuff that feels really familiar to you and some stuff less so. And hopefully we'll kind of touch touch what everyone's hoping to get from this over the time. Um, for us, it's really helpful as well. I say for us, mainly for Texas, I should say, um, to have an understanding of where the needs are and where perhaps support could be put in place, either from Nature Scott or either communities getting together. So just um, Bear that in mind if there are things that jump out at you as actually this would be a really helpful thing for all of us moving forward, then we can have that conversation towards the end. So this afternoon, um, I think Texas sent out a workshop plan to you. I'm going to warn you now that I am. Um, I'm very much a, a facilitator of workshops, and so I spend my time putting together plans and then completely setting fire to them because everything gets too interesting. So we're going to see where this goes, but the main thing is that we're going to do a couple of short talks just to kind of uh, set the scene, I guess, to understand what it is we're all looking at. Um, we'll try and keep those short. Then we're going to have lots of space for questions, discussions, um, thinking about where we can move forward. So uh, it will not be, hopefully it won't be much more of me talking is where I'm going to go with this. So I'd really like to kick off because I know a lot of you probably know each other very well, but I don't. Um, and ask everyone to introduce themselves. So I'm going to just call your name or whatever name uh, comes up on my screen for you. So I'm, I'm sorry, some of you apparently might have to just figure out who, who, who you are today. Um, so if you could just tell me your name, what organisation you're from or representing and where you're at with underwater monitoring from absolutely no idea to do all the time. Just tell me what kind of things you're up to. So I'm going to start with Jane, please. Oh, you're on mute. That's the first uh, the first test is you have to unmute. <laughs> no. There we go. Hi. As if I've never done that before. Okay. Um, I'm the coordinator of a brand new group called Merrill Friends of Loch Torridon. Nice. Um, and we, we set that group, set up the group at the end of the year, having seen one film from Sarah Nason 
uh, pink merle and salmon farming, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Uh, we had 50 people from the community come and see it. And given that Torridon's population is around 200, that's fantastic. Since then, we've set up a group and we've been, um, we've managed to get some funding for training, which we're going to do very soon from Sea Search. Um, and our first dives and forays will be at the end of April, early May, where the divers and snorkelers and kayakers amongst us um, will attempt our very first survey, albeit um, more of a fun dive, but, but basically setting the scene so that we can um, learn how to do it properly. So this is fantastic timing for us. Um, and I would also say Gregor, though he's there with Blue Hope Alliance, is one of our group as well. So. Fantastic. Well, well done. For the promise. Thank you. It's really nice to have you here while you're you're full of hope and excitement as well. That's so nice to have, have people oh, kicking off. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just I'm taking some notes so I understand who everyone is and where the kind of connections are. So thank you for that. Um, Gregor, then would you like to go as you've been kind of warmly introduced in? I, uh, thank you, Jane, for coming on the spot. Um, yeah, Gregor, two hats, um, definitely involved. Can you start with Jane's group? Um, it's very happy to still continue to be part of that in Loch uh, I suppose that led in some ways to me to a new post um, with Blue Hope Alliance, who I'm very new to it, so I'm still trying to work out exactly what we do, but we connect communities with um, the marine and coastal environment. So um, they started off with the National Marine Protected Area in the Summer Isles and um, Sea Search using Sea Search surveys with communities. So um, I'm, I'm very interested in this workshop. Like Jane says, it's very timely. And I'm following the book as well as we, as we speak. So that's really useful. Thank you. Excellent. That's that's a good student sign that you brought the textbook along. So well done for winning those points right from the off. Um, oh, people jumping around for me. Uh, okay, Lindsay. Um, hi, I'm Lindsay, and this is my husband Gavin, and we're from South Sky Seas Initiative. Um, we've been doing underwater surveys for a few years, although not very many lately. And we've got a Blue Rolf underwater drone, and we've also been um, doing surveys with GoPros from kayaks or foot or boats. <laughs> so, um, is there anything else we've? That's it. That probably sums it up. And uh, the aim of the surveys is we're sort of trying mainly to find seagrass and merle to get the locations documented. So hopefully we can get them protected in the future. Thank you very much. It's really nice to have you. Okay, Gavin. Hello, I'm Gavin Stephen of Fresh Um I'm a volunteer with Aran Coast. Um, some have uh, been, we've been talking to people like South Sky for, for quite a while. Um, I'm the one that kind of looks after the ROVs. Okay. Uh, we have a two, we have a small trident, um, which the company has gone bust. Uh, so it's in its last legs. And the we also have a Blue Rolf 2, um, one of the earlier versions, but nonetheless, it's um, quite serviceable. Uh, what have we used it for? Well, last year, um, Convex came uh, up to Arin and uh, we did a preliminary survey of some of the sites that they would uh, like to see. And we took our ROV down to 90 meters, which was an achievement for us. Um, since up to that point, we've had some serious leakages in it. Anyway, um, we also have the um, uh, marine protected area, the no-take zone, and we've been using it on there, uh, trying to monitor um, some of the moral beds in particular. Um, uh, and uh, we're expecting to use some sci uh, citizen science projects this year um, uh, and take the ROVs out and uh, let people use them because the more people that use them, the more information that comes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And it sounds like you've got a, a reasonable amount of experience going on there with ROVs. So we'll be looking I'm to you for your... I'm, I'm in the book. I'm in the book. Oh, wow. In that case. 
fame indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Vanessa and Martin. Hi. Um, so uh, we're based on Sky. Uh, we're sea search divers, um, but we get involved in lots of other things as well and networks in the community here, um, like the South Sky Seas Initiative and things. We're kind of trying to help out with that and um, something called Project Baseline as well, which is um, an international scheme for underwater monitoring as well. So every, everything we do is, is involved in diving <laughs> and recording. So and, and we're pretty active with that. Brilliant. Thank you. That's great. Lots of sea search people here, I, I see. Um, OK, uh, Diana. I'm involved with the um, Wikinch Local Nature Reserve. We have a group of volunteers. We just started doing um, foreshore surveys. I'm really here to see whether it's feasible or not for us to look at doing underwater surveys. So I'm very much in a listening to everybody else. No, that's perfect. You're very welcome. So it's great to kind of uh, understand all the challenges at the start before you launch into whatever it is. So yeah, perfect timing. Um, cool, Charlotte. So hi, yeah, I'm uh, with the Berwick Marine Reserve. Um, we've very much only started dipping our toes into um, the underwater monitoring side of things, uh, working with St. Alpha Marine Station um, and using their ROV. Uh, last year we started surveying for uh, horse mussels um, in the waters of the, of the marine reserve um, and we're kind of hoping to expand that underwater monitoring so uh, quite interested to see uh, from what comes after today's meeting. Fantastic brilliant so nicely just testing I, I enjoyed your pun there actually was what I was going to say so thank you for that set the scene for where we want the rest of the day to go. Um, cool Danny. Yeah, hi. Um, I work for uh, Sea Wilding in Loch Craignish, and we're a native oyster and a seagrass restoration project. Um, and we do a lot of intertidal biodiversity and native oyster surveys. Um, underwater, we do uh, quite a lot of bruv surveys, baited GoPros and GoPro surveys on top of kayaks and things, but also with snorkeling. Um, that's to look at sort of our donor meadows and our, our seagrass restoration sites. I, and we've we've got a pretty advanced ROV camera, which, to the best of my knowledge, has not yet been used. <laughs> but it, but I hope it will be very soon. And um, so I don't do a lot of the surveying. Other members, we have a science and two science and survey officers. They do, but I'm very interested in in this conversation generally and how we might improve. Fantastic. Well, let's hope you can we can wet your ROV's head uh, after this session. I think we had some of your colleagues with us yesterday as well. So between you'll have some have some things to move forward with um i've got katie hi everyone um sorry i've got my camera off i'll just put it on but my signal's quite poor so if it cuts off i'll just turn it off again <laughs> um so i'm here on behalf of the fair Isle marine research organization and um, i'm the project officer for the fair Isle demonstration and research mpa um and my role is hosted by nature scott as well um, so I'm really here to kind of find out more about what everyone else is doing. Um, Faro Marine Research Organisation do have some equipment already from the Nature Scott Community Led Biodiversity. I struggle with that as well. Biodiversity Monitoring Equipment Fund. Um, so at the moment we've mostly got equipment for intertidal monitoring um, at, and like a GoPro and that sort of thing. We've also got um, some baited landers as well. So really just wanting to see what other folk are doing and if there's anything else we could implement um, as we're really trying to expand a bit more on the citizen science projects um, and the community-led monitoring side of the, the research projects that are going on as part of the DRMPA. So yeah, looking forward to what other people are up to and whether we can learn anything from, from everyone. Brilliant, and I, I definitely think so. I think there's probably lots of lots of knowledge we can share there, so that's, that's great. Um, uh, Finley? Hi there, uh, so this is Jonathan and I, um, so we're from the St. Isles Marine Station, um, so as Charlotte mentioned before, um, we'll be looking at uh, horse mussels 
or looking for horse mussels um, within the Berkshire Marine Reserve. Um, if anybody has any previous experience with chasing ROVs, um, you might have a similar experience as us. Uh, we seem to spend more time fixing said ROVs than um, than actually looking for anything. Um, but we've got some new equipment in just now, um, so we're very much looking forward to kind of seeing what everyone else is up to um, and try and get back out this year and do some surveys as well. Brilliant. Um, I think we could probably do an entire separate day on ROV troubleshooting. So <laughs> we'll write that down somewhere as to as to a future need. Yeah. Um, cool. Really nice to meet you. Thank you, um, Claire. Hi, yeah, I'm from Solway Firth Partnership um, down in the Solway and we are um, working on a big project. Uh, we're just waiting for the money to be released for our Solway Coast and Marine project. But on the run up to it, we've been doing quite a lot of trying to do some baseline mapping, which has been really mostly intertidal. So we've been doing mapping of intertidal seagrass and salt marsh opportunity mapping, but we've also I have to say we've had a consultant to do the seagrass intertidal mapping, but moving forward, we'd obviously like to do much more kind of citizen science and getting local people involved. And again, we have done um, oyster native oyster survey of Loch Ryan with Harriet Watt University, who um, are the kind of experts in doing that. So we are looking towards um, subtidal seagrass survey. Um, we've had a drone trial, but not very successful. It's quite difficult in Solway because it's really murky. So um, kind of looking for um, possibilities of, of different ways of doing kind of subtitle surveys of in the wider Solway for um, the potential for native oyster restoration and like say seagrass. And we have got um, local dive group at Newton Stewart and they have been doing a bit of, of work as well, but obviously they're limited to what they can do. I think the Solway is probably because it's so tidal, it's quite difficult to, to kind of dive regularly in it. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so it's nice to to hear kind of starting the title and trying to, to move down and, and see these techniques. So that's that's perfect. Um, fabulous. Erica. Uh, yeah, thanks. I think most of my side has kind of been covered by everyone else um, that yeah, I work with. So. Um, so, yeah, I also work at the St. Abbs Marine Station with Finlay and Jump, and it is through our funding that we got through SMEF that we worked with the Berkshire Marine Reserve uh, last summer. Um, to look for horse mussels uh, with an ROV and that also involves some divers from Project Baseline that was funded through a kind of side project with Blue Marine. Um, and yeah, so basically now through some more from the SMEF funding, we have our own ROV. So we're kind of hoping that today will sort of help us. Yeah, because we, we are traditionally a research aquarium. So most of our research has really been, yeah, in that space and not actually out in the field. So. Perfect. That's that's great and good to hear you've kind of got new kit coming as well <laughs> by the sounds of it. You sound you needed it. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, Catherine, I think you just joined us. Are you happy to say who you are and any experience with kind of underwater monitoring so far? Uh, yes, I'm perfectly happy. Um, I am staying at Torridon and have been aware of this project from the new group that's been set up. Uh, I'm uh, I don't have any particular skills to bring. I'm just interested in in hearing what's going on. Uh, I am a scuba diver, but not a, an adventurous one. So um, <laughs> you won't find me tangling with too much of the wildlife, but I'm very happy to participate if I can. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We did have some people complaining last night about uh, going diving during the winter. So I think totally fine to be a non-adventurous warm weather diver. No problem mm -hmm. at all. Um, Neil will tell you all about that later. And um, and I think now I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. The person that's masquerading as everyone else on Teams, but would you like to introduce yourself properly? Is, is that me? <laughs> yes, it is, I'm afraid. Sorry. Yes. Um, I'm Ailsa and I also work for Sea Wilding, but based up in Loch Broom and um, so I've done a bit of a lot of intertidal surveying a bit of snorkel surveying none with an ROV and whether I get one will depend on Danny um, and just so St Abs know there's loads of horse mussels here don't know if that's interesting and they actually grow in the intertidal so I don't need an ROV <laughs> but that's me thank you Thank you. And sorry, I, I now have your name down so I, we can actually call you my name in the future. Um, have I missed anybody? Hoping that I 
Okay, well, perfect. Well, thank you so much for the introductions. That's really helpful for me to get a feel for the kind of range of experience we have here. And I think it's nice that everyone's at different places because it means that we really can start to hopefully share a bit of information. So I'm going to just take five, ten minutes to um, particularly for the people that are just kicking off and really starting their journey with untitled underwater subtitle monitoring. Um, just to introduce some of the methods in the community led marine biodiversity monitoring handbook um, just thinking about what they're used for what's in there and in particular maybe what's missing and what kind of purposes you might want so i'm going to use that to just kick a little bit of conversation off about what's in the book what you're doing and maybe what we might want to think about for the future so i'm hoping you'll forgive me because what i am going to do unfortunately is just share my screen so we can look at some pictures at the same time um, it also means that i do lose you a little bit so I am going to ask you to kind of uh, pop your hand up or, or um, say something uh, if I if I don't call on you it's not because I, I don't want to hear from you it's because I'm kind of stuck between two screens right now so please forgive me um, but I just wanted to kind of recap that the purpose of today really is not obviously so we can train everybody in doing uh, underwater monitoring or that we can unfortunately troubleshoot all our OVs. Um, it's really just to have that kind of discussion and knowledge sharing around some of the benefits of underwater monitoring that people have, have found, some of the challenges that they found. So people are particularly that are new are going to have something that they can understand and go into. Um, maybe overcome some barriers that you've got so we can help you move forward or whatever it is you want to do or, or maybe spark some insights and think about what it is you want to do and as I said just to give us an idea of where everyone's at what may be training needs or requirements or anything is that you need to kind of help us move forward and then we can think about how to do that as a community so I'm hoping that's okay um, I would say I also have a uh, a nice copy of the community led marine biodiversity monitoring always by my side um, and what I'm going to do is just uh, talk through really a couple of the underwater methods that are there so if you haven't had a chance to look through or, or not something you've really engaged with so far you've got just that baseline understanding so really there are only two underwater observation methods that are um, really listed in the book um, the first one is, is just called underwater observation, and that is very much an introductory method. So if you are new to this, you can use this method and it helps you capture all the, the kind of metadata, the associated data you need in order to do what we would consider, a, I guess, a scientifically robust survey. So this is very much a kind of fixed survey station. So you don't have to move. You can do it from a kayak. You can do it from a boat without um, the need for anything kind of more high tech. Um, you can use pretty much any equipment. So for those of you that have ROVs, you can drop it down. You can use pole cams. You can uh, duct tape a GoPro to a bit of pipe. I think that's a pretty standard method. And you are really just recording what's there. Um, alongside the other data you need like GPS and, and the depth so the kind of environmental data around you. Um, now this is very much a kind of primary scoping survey so for those of you that are interested in uh, just finding out what's there maybe you have an MPA or a particular area you want to see what species are present um, you can use that as evidence of presence if there are particular things you're looking for if you wanted to you could do a kind of fixed survey station come back to the same location and start looking at changes over time um, but really this is this is just to help you understand what is under there so for those of you that have perhaps got much more focused needs this wouldn't be the the ideal way of doing it but it'll be a, a first start basically um, there are this is my kind of uh, driving force is that I do a lot of citizen science work um, and we do quite a lot of work around data basically so how we can use data how data are available for citizen science projects and how good it is um, and I am a huge advocate for how good it is and how good it can be but in order to do that you need to be following set methods that mean that basically that people can take it seriously that people know that um, your data are robust and that the they say what they say you're going to do. So the guides in the book um, mean that you are collecting the right kind of data. Now they mean you're collecting the right kind of data but I am aware there are some 
big challenges around um, the confidence people have in what they're doing. So something like a GPS position, as long as you can work a smartphone or a Garmin or whatever it is, you're fairly confident you've got that right. When it comes to things like substrate, and if you've been through the kind of guides in the book, you'll know it, it moves from cobbles to sand to mud. To, and it all sounds very sensible and very easily uh, kind of figured out. And then as soon as you get looking at cameras or videos or even in the intertidal, you start going, is that a cobble? Is that a, a boulder? Is that what size is my head compared to everyone else's head? So that we're aware there are challenges there and there are certain um, uh, there's a certain level of confidence that I think it takes in terms of practice and perhaps that's something we can help you with or, or, or share as we, we move forward. Um, so the second type of survey that's really listed in the book is a drift line transect. So this is actually quite similar to the first one except you are allowing a, a boat or a kayak or, or some kind of vessel um, to move and you are pulling the camera with you. <clears throat> so this isn't much use for people with ROVs because ROVs are very difficult to pilot in this kind of line. Um, again, what you're doing is essentially over a wider area, collecting information on species presence, on distribution. Um, so it's really it's a bit of an extension of the other one that gives you a wider picture of what's happening in the area. But again, if you're just doing it in small uh, you're doing it in a few places. It's not a very kind of structured survey over the whole area. It's quite difficult for us to get more information from it. Um, so in terms of doing a kind of robust scientific survey, these kind of points or, or drift counts without a wider structure aren't going to be much use. But if your purpose is to I want to see if we have horse muscles or I'm trying to explore what I have in this area, then it's perfect because it gives you that first understanding of what species are there. Um, and again, I'm just going to highlight using the survey plan templates, um, making sure you've got all that information. I can't, I get really boring, my students get really bored with me, but I can't emphasize enough the importance of kind of collecting the metadata, even if it feels like you are just doing really basic stuff and you're having a bit of a play to start off with. The more recording of data you can do, the more if you do find something exciting, you have everything to support that. Um, it might be that key piece of information you can use going forward. So one of the things that is um, noted in this particular sheet is, is it a possible PMF? Now, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the terms we use around PMFs and biotopes. Now for some of you this is going to be really familiar, others maybe less so. So all I'm doing is just really talking about what your purpose is and what you're trying to achieve and why some of these terms are in there and maybe why you want to engage with them and maybe why you absolutely don't. So there's no problem either way. Um, it's just thinking about what it is you you want to get from your surveys, what your group wants to get. So the other type of monitoring that is in the handbook um, is very much around mapping particular areas or monitoring the quality of the habitat, so potentially a change over time. Now, in the book, this is only really for shallow, very shallow subtitle or exposed into tidal. So things like, I know we've got people from sea wilding here, so mapping seagrass beds, for example, um, or mussel beds. You can do this snorkeling, so a few of you have mentioned snorkeling. That's something challenging but possible. Um, this is the kind of thing it's much harder to do in the kind of deeper water. So I know a few of you have mentioned ROVs. Um, what there isn't at the moment is a kind of ROV guide. Uh, that's because it, it is quite challenging. Um, but if that's something there is appetite for, then uh, I'm going to have to kneel after this and we'll talk about some methods of doing that. So um, again, if you're identifying things that aren't meeting your needs or that you want to adapt, that's totally fine. The guidebook is here to give you um, a starting point for your purpose, but also something to think about if you want your data to go beyond your community and be comparable potentially to other other types of data across Scotland. So I just want to pick up on that um, term PMF or priority marine feature. Now, people tend to have heard of this and know about it, but I know some people haven't. So this is just an introduction in case it's not something that's familiar to you. Um, it is. I think it can be quite a divisive term. I know some people are not a fan of the idea. Um, it is we're working with what we've got. And this 
I think it was about 13 years ago. Now they had the, the Marine Atlas and the priority marine features came about through a lot of consultation and discussion and, and fighting, if I'm honest, um, about all the habitats and species we had that were covered by legislation, agreements and, and different protections and linked to what Scotland is important for and what function they have. And eventually came out of the wash into 81 priority marine features. And that's habitats and species that are a priority for conservation of Scotland seas. So the key thing is that this was developed by Marine Scotland, by JNCC, by um, Nature Scott or SNH as they were then. And so they're in the marine plan. This is a conservation policy priority definition. So if you want to have policy impact, if you want to be um, have your area noticed or to feel like you are being taken seriously in these kind of statutory conversations, then identifying PMFs and knowing what they are, particularly the ones that are listed as vulnerable, um, are key in terms of what you're surveying. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you know this, but some of the things that are vulnerable PMFs, things like Serpolid reefs, so Loch Creeran, um, I don't think anyone said they were from Loch Creeran here, but I know there's some of you in the kind of Argyle West Coast. Oops, sorry. Um, flame shell beds, so uh, Loch Alsh, some of you up, up from that kind of way. Um, I read a paper the other day that flame shell beds have like 300 odd invertebrate species they're supporting. So they're pretty fantastic um, kind of reef builders, uh, aggregate builders. Things like seagrass, I don't, I've got the people here that actually know far more about seagrass than I do, but um, again, a huge amount of interest in that and, and the restoration at the moment and some of the kind of slightly odder uh, types of habitats we have. So sea loch egg rack, things that are kind of very specific um, forms and, and particular types we have rarely here in Scotland. Um, and then, of course, things like kelp, which as you can see from these maps. I don't know if any of you use the kind of uh, marine maps, but they are great to just have an idea of where records are and where they aren't. And that can help you, particularly in your local areas, think about where you could add value and add information about PMS. So just a couple more things I want to say before I'm going to hand back over. Um, one of which is that in the marine monitoring handbook, it does say that when you are uploading or considering data, you can think about classifying it as biotopes. And I know we've had some questions about um, how people can do that effectively. Um, I think these are a useful tool. They are uh, recommended by statutory bodies. So JNCC use them. Um, they use them to kind of visualize patterns of habitat types across the UK. So essentially a biotope is uh, a code that is given to a species and associated physical characteristics. So in this example I have here, this is sublatoral macrophyte dominated communities on sediment. So uh, underwater, algae dominated, but on a specific type of, of substrate, so on sediment substrate. So you're kind of combining all those things together into one code. Um, and that means that it's kind of like 3D information you're getting about things. You're putting a lot of stuff together, which can be really useful if you want to understand changing patterns of different habitat types across the UK. What I would say um, is that there is some really good guide on how to assign biotopes. We have the marine habitat classification for Britain and Ireland. It is incredibly challenging to do. If it's already tough to think about how you tell the difference between a cobble and a boulder, and I will tell you that it I find it so as well. Um, that's that's you know something that can be very difficult. It's even more so when you start thinking about biotopes. So when we do um, specific biotope surveys, for example, you're often using um, a lot of different substrate forms. Sometimes you're taking grab samples as well. You're talking about percentage composition of different particle types. Uh, you're recording data on um, a sac for scale, which is maybe something you're familiar with, but kind of abundance scale. Uh, so there's, it can be really valuable. But with all of this, what I would say is think about what you want to get from this. If you want to contribute to this biotope map, fantastic. Like that is something you can um, absolutely upskill and learn to do. It is possible, I think, for communities to do that. But 
is it what you want to do or do you want to understand what species in your area because in that case it probably isn't the most useful thing you could do with your time so i'm very aware that everyone gives up their time to do this and although you're passionate about it um you want to you want to make the most of that and want to feel like you're getting the most value from it. So part of the conversation we want to have is thinking about what do you want to get from this and therefore what is the best method to achieve that? So finally, and kind of linking on from that, um, there is some great guidance about where your data can go. So obviously it's your data, absolutely use it um, in any way you want, but I think one of the amazing things about the, the internet and the kind of connected world we have now is that capacity to share data, and particularly with networks like this. Um, and so part of the reason for this kind of shared handbook is that people are going to collect data in the same way. It can be or could be comparable between different areas, and particularly if you manage your data where uh, manage your data well. Um, and a lot of that is recording saving, uploading, sharing data, even if you don't think you need to, having all that backup information is so critical. So I have a student at the moment who's doing an entire thesis on taking some citizen science data that was collected for a specific purpose and seeing if it can be used for a different purpose. And the answer is yes, with so many caveats. But so many of those caveats could be overcome if you record really good metadata around who is collecting it, for what purpose, where, when, why, all the kind of uh, classic questions. So a lot of this is about accurate record keeping, finding ways to um, share data meaningfully. And so there are recommendations on things like logging your metadata on admin, um, Sorry, metadata on Medin, um, using data repositories. It could be that we need a shared one between us, the kind of questions you might want to be thinking about. OK, I have talked uh, for far too long. I'm hoping some of that is new to people or some of it is is um, kind of maybe bringing up some thoughts or questions. So I'm going to hand over in a minute to my colleague Neil who's going to talk more about the actual underwater monitoring the type of thing he does but I want to ask anyone have any comments questions on what they're doing on what they think they might like to do and how it fits in with some of this data management and um, specific terms have I stunned you all into excited silence with citizen science data chat <laughs> Actually, um, uh, Hannah, I think it would be useful um, uh, for those that are going down the uh, ROV route um, that uh, if there was some form of community forum that we could all hook into, um, uh, it's a learning curve. Yep. Um, I think you alluded that, to that yourself, um, but if everybody had a common point um, either to assist others or just to make people aware that this is happening or that's happening. I think it would be useful. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. And I think particularly for ROVs that can be um, quite a learning curve, as, as, as you pointed out quite nicely. And I think we had a kind of similar suggestion last night as well. So I'm, I'm, I've taken a note of that and that might be something we think about, you know, can we coordinate or support going forward? Um, great. Any other kind of comments? Questions? Anything that's blown your mind out of that? No. OK, what I'm going to do then is I am going to um, ask Neil to come and talk. Are you there, Neil? Yeah, um, I'll just share my screen as well. So I'll, I'll um, give you a bit of an introduction to myself and um, show you a few slides. Uh, let me just share the screen. <clears throat> oh, Hannah, you're in the in the seat in the corner of my screen. Again, can you give me a nod if you can see the? Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. So my email address is at the bottom of the of the screen. Um, so please 
um, Hannah mentioned already, but do just get in contact. If something crops up after, um, this is obviously a bit of a whistle stop tour, um, but if something crops up that you want to discuss or um, ask for suggestions on, then um, please do feel free just to just to email at, at any point. For some reason, whenever I click space, uh, I end up muting myself, which is not ideal for moving a PowerPoint. But um, there we go. OK, so um, my uh, area of interest and, and the, the, the sort of research that I do really focuses on <clears throat> where animals spend most of their time. Um, so what habitats they occupy um, and and um, the the locations as well as the the um, nature of that that habitat so I look at distributions um, and quite often these shifts in distributions and when um, especially marine organisms um, move dis uh, or shift their distributions it's it's through life stages so you get juveniles in one area and adults in another um, so you get this sort of got this this connectivity running around a system and that obviously has effects on on the health of that system so so the way that that links to ecosystem health is is of key importance to uh, to my research the diagram that you can see at the bottom of the slide there is the kind of go-to tropical example of this that everybody's familiar with, where we have um, mangrove forests, uh, seagrass and, and coral reefs. You can see lots of different species of fish and uh, lots of different age groups um, of, those, of those species. And importantly, from my perspective, a lot of arrows connecting all of these different systems. When we remove one of those components, um, in this case, the, the mangrove, we end up seeing a massive reduction in the number of species that are there and, and also the, the numbers of individuals of the species that, that manage to, to remain. So all of this stuff should be probably pretty familiar to everybody and, and it, it all makes kind of, kind of common sense. Um, where I'm trying to push our research at, at the moment, in uh, in our sort of understanding of marine environments is is looking through this idea of this lens of a seascape. So, <clears throat> in marine habitats, what we tend to do is kind of focus on the, uh, the the type of environment that an animal is living in at the point at which it's either physically caught in a net or caught on um, caught on camera. Um, as you can see, the the dogfish in the um, image at the bottom there, um, and we focus on that individual in uh, that in individual habitat. Um, and what I'm trying to do is start to think about the way that other habitats link together and and how they might be important. Because in the same way as um, terrestrial species, same as birds do, they'll use and occupy different environments at different times throughout the throughout the day, throughout the year throughout their, their life cycle. So this idea of um, seascape um, concepts is um, the, the diagram on the left hand side is some work that we did in the, in the Caribbean. Um, so I mean, it's hard, hard going, I know, doing this job, but um, somebody's got to do it. So we were looking at different patch sizes um, and the, the configuration of these patches. So the way that the, the patches are arranged um, in relation to each other and and what effect that had on the, the species abundance. Um, the, the idea of seascape concepts that we're probably more familiar with and maybe thinking a bit more about in UK waters is this kind of what's represented on the, the right hand side of the slide um, with this sort of idea of, of patch diversity. Um, and there are a few hints from <clears throat> um, work that's been done uh, in the South Arran MPA that show that um, you get increased abundance of of um, just juvenile gadoids, so like cod and, and haddock and whiting. So you increased abundance where there are more different types of, of habitats around about. Um, so although obviously we've got pictures of the, the, the kind of, um, it's not the best Merrill picture in the world, but it was the best one I can find that I, that I had. Um, but, you know, although we've got these key kind of uh, PMFs and, and uh, components to the habitat, it, it's quite often like the range of these things that 
that's important. Um, so some of the work that we're doing at the moment is taking place in uh, Wester Ross. The reason that I included the slide here is just to just to to um, make sure that we're we're all on the same page when we're thinking about what it what it means for an area to be designated as an NPA. So my uh, research location is kind of defined on the uh, on the right hand map. Um, everything sort of south of the the orange line and into Little Loch Broom is is where I'm focusing on. It's just a kind of arbitrary definition of of where I think Little Loch Broom begins and ends. But the important bit about this is that we've we've got a multi-use MPA here, so we've got multi-use protection, and that that tends to be the way that um, the way that the MPAs are, or people want to um, designate MPAs. So it's super important that we collect a wide range of data. And um, there was a couple of questions last uh, or yesterday evening about the, about the zeros. So throwing a camera into the water and not seeing the thing that you're looking for. And it's really important that the, the recognizing that those zero um, or the the absence of something is is also a kind of useful bit of data, although it's maybe not the the bit of data that you um, are are excited to to see. Um, so just to give you an idea of the the amount of uh, sampling that we do for a um, for a, a mapping exercise. So this is a, a zoomed in shot of Little Loch Broom. And we opted this in this one for um, a random set of camera drops. And each um, each set of camera drops is, is stratified by depth as well. So we can come back to these, these kind of thoughts about um, how we design surveys and, and what works best. There's no there's no one rule fits all. But um, we, we just have to kind of do the best with what we've got. Um, a, a parallel work is also taking place up in uh, Loch Erebon, up just round from, from Cape Wrath, where uh, we've got a similar sort of number of drops. So there are 216 um, baited camera drops at each one of these black points. And this gives you a pretty good map of, uh, of, the, of the seabed. Um, and one of the the papers that we've got in uh, review at the moment is is this idea of trying to develop a, a method to predict what types of seabeds are at the locations that we haven't yet looked at. Um, so th this kind of brings me back round to one of the things that Hannah was talking about, which is this idea of like trying trying to characterise stuff. Um, Last uh, like yesterday evening, I used the analogy of of music, and it works quite well. So you wouldn't ever find the album in either for the younger folks on YouTube or on uh, the Apple um, Music Store. And for us oldies, when you walked into HMV, you can't find your Iron Maiden or Def Leppard album if nobody's told you that it falls into the category of like metal or rock or something like that. So categories are a really useful idea, but we're always we're always pinpointing the kind of perfect example. So um, this idea of whether does this fall into the category of cobble or does this fall into the category of boulder is one that everybody faces. So as scientists, we we are really you know we, we sort of struggle with these with these ideas as well. Um, and developing this mapping project, um, we had to we had to overcome some of those, and some of the categories just needed to be merged together. So this is some of the survey equipment I use for the for the mapping work. So you can see in the the picture in the top uh, right hand side of the slide, um, we have um, a baited camera set up. So this is a commercially bought one. It's relatively cheap <clears throat> um, from a company called uh, CGIS. They're an Australian based company. Um, I can put the link in the chat if, if folks are interested. Um, it just uses uh, GoPros so in the uh, in the nacelles up at the um, in on each side of the, the frame is a, a standard GoPro camera. It has an extra battery pack in it. Um, these are uh, Scuba Pro torches. 
just normal dive torches, nice long burn time. Um, and this is a Tupperware box with holes drilled in it. Um, and these are cable ties, which are obviously super important for all uh, marine science. And the bait is, in this case, is, is mackerel. So we just we just stay consistent with the with the baits. Um, so there, there's a number of different drop down camera systems. We use stereo cameras so that we can measure the length of fish and the distances away from the camera that objects are. So because of the um, because of the, the stereo camera, we can measure the, the length of this RAS and also how much area coverage the uh, the video footage is, is taking in and, and things like that. The stereo camera is also quite useful because of the redundancy factor. So the number of times that one of the one of the uh, cameras maybe packs in is higher than you would than you would like. Um, so the video that you're about to see is the one that I use for um, sort of schools liaison stuff and and if we're doing like community engagement. And I ask the I ask the, the the students that are there to count the haddock that they see in the video, and it starts off relatively straightforward, um, and then starts to get a bit a bit more difficult. Um, so some fish leave, and then something else comes back in, but being haddock, they all kind of look quite haddocky. Um, it's really hard to tell which ones you've already counted and which which ones um, are, are new fish coming in. And then obviously that that ramps up the more the more and more fish that you get. So <clears throat> the way that we do this and the, the, the point of showing you this is to, to show that there is there is almost no perfect way of counting things. So the species on the left hand side of this uh, slide are really easy to count. They stay still. The larger species on the right hand side is difficult because the the individual that's now kind of in the middle of the three moved in and out of the of the camera frame. So the way around this is we use a, a measure called a max n. So it is a measure of abundance, but it's a it's a relative measure of abundance. Um, it means that we can compare um, years, so we can compare through uh, samples through time or in different locations that have used the same the same method but we can't actually give you an answer to how many fish there are in the sea in one area using using something like max n but all of these choices that that you make and hopefully that these choices are made at the beginning um with you know with with some sort of reference to um some of the the uh, manuals that are out there and and other people's experience um they're always a trade off so there there is no perfect answer to any of these things um one of the things that we did in the summer up at uh, last summer anyway up at um, Westeros and also uh, Loch Erebol was do some skate egg surveys um so we borrowed uh, the ROV from uh, Sue Pomeroy um, at uh, Little Loch Broom Marine Life, and we came up with a, a, a sort of working um, prototype strategy for doing these egg surveys. So it should it should work for for most people. Um, you can adapt it as well. It doesn't have to just be for ROVs. You can uh, use the same thing for for dived transects. Um, what we can do later on is I can I, I said uh, to the group um, last night that we'll maybe get Texa to to circulate um, this document round and we can uh, we can have have everybody critique it and see what they think and see see how uh, see how how we can um, improve it. But the the diagram that you can see is my uh, rough drawing of the the setup. So um, if I can get my cursor to appear, there's a leaded line with uh, distances marked out on it to follow with the ROV. Um, so we dropped we dropped the the mooring line as a floating uh, rope. Uh, you drop the weight at uh, at a location, <clears throat> take a GPS coordinate. Allow uh, allow the the boat to move along into the current, playing out the um, the transect uh, rope, and then drop another weight at the other end of the transect, 
um, rope. It doesn't really matter how long this was. We uh, it is we used um, sixty meters, um, and you can you can take the the ROV in. You find the the buoys quite nice and easily, bright orange, and then you can follow the you can follow follow the mooring line down. Um, and we got some some pretty decent transects um, done. It's relatively quick. Um, depends how wild the sea is up at uh, Loch Erebol. Obviously, it's um, pretty wild, so uh, we get fewer done there. And then, obviously, you've got battery time to to worry about. So I'll I'll kind of round off um, I'll round off at this point. But I figured is that there are plenty of videos of different bits of uh, sea pens and uh, northern uh, feather stars and all all sorts. But um, I figured I'd, I'd round off with with a little bit of footage of, with what you can get with these drop down cameras. So this is this is the sort of work where uh, or this is the data that we're working with. Um, so you can see some some cobble maybe boulder cobble boulder stuff going on there um this is why these things are are, are difficult to uh, to categorize because they don't they don't necessarily easily fall into into categories um and we get quite a lot of skate coming along to coming along to these uh these bait boxes as well in in these locations so um we get some get some nice um, footage, but it's nice and you know it's nice and clear from from relatively inexpensive equipment, and um, so you don't you don't have to um, spend masses and masses of cash on on this sort of stuff. And um, as I said, there's lots of uh, there's lots more videos and things like that which I'm more than happy to share with you. But it's probably better to get some feedback and um, a little bit of discussion going on on this kind of stuff. So ho hopefully you get the the sort of impression that we're um we struggle with as many of the different aspects of this kind of stuff as as you do so it's not it's not like there is an automatic solution to how do we characterize this type of seabed habitat how do we count these animals um it, it's literally problems that everybody faces all of the time and the difficulty with these problems is that, that there is actually no good solid solution for all of it um, or well, Han Hannah wouldn't have a job, and neither would I if that was the if that was the case. And and your um, your interests would would be a lot less interesting than, than they are. So yeah, I think um, Hannah, do you want to do you want to sort of chair questions, and we can um, throw it open. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for that, Neil. Um, I know we quite often just offer more questions than than answers, but also really happy to have that conversation. So if there's anything really specific from uh, the brand of duct tape or cable tires Neil uses to how you do any of this or design surveys, then this is the chance to kind of really throw this open. So if you just want to raise a, a virtual hand, if you have a question, a comment, anything you want to put in, um, that would be fab. Claire, you jumped straight in there, so go for it. Yeah, so a couple of times um, you kind of mentioned, Neil, that it's relatively inexpensive, but what do you mean by that? Like, you know, a rough price, just to give us a bit of an idea? So the the GoPros, which, uh, so we are, we are surveying down to 160 metres um, with, with those, um, those uh, C uh, GIS systems. The GoPros are about sort of 400 pounds if you buy uh, like a, an up-to-date um, model. Um, you don't need two of them, uh, you can just use one. And the camera frames that we've got with the two um, the, the two housings on them are about a thousand pounds. So whether that's cheap or not, um, it depends on what, what your what your budget is, I guess. But um, you can buy the GoPro housing, the waterproof housing for the one that you would take diving or something like that for, um, I think they're about £40 now. They've gone a bit cheaper and that will go down to 60 metres, which is which is good enough um, for, for an awful lot of work. The torches, those ones are, those ones are excellent. They're kind of hundred odd pounds um, and I can't remember who it was yesterday mentioned the great idea, and this this works a treat of uh, just using a creel. So if you get a metal creel, they usually land bottom down. 
um, and and uh, strapping the GoPro to that. So I, I don't know. Does that does that sound cheap, or am I like? I think it sounds reasonable because that sounds like the kind of amount that you can easily apply for funding for, you know, from quite a small grant fund. So I think that sounds fair enough. Or, or borrow it. I mean, have my stuff if you want. Oh, I say you. mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, this all this stuff, text, I'm going to throw you under the bus at this point, but Nature Scott, I've got three of exactly those uh, types of uh, like sets of equipment. Um, I think they are actually using them at the moment um, for the, the stuff that you'll have seen up uh, in uh, Westeros with the herring um, spawning grounds. But um, we like I, my PhD students use use that equipment in the summer. It is sitting there for the rest of the time. I'm quite quite happy to um, lend it out, help help people use it. Um, so yeah, that like. There's loads of this available, so you don't necessarily have to have your own stuff. It's great. It's good fun having your own stuff. But I should add that Neil is also available for a very reasonable rate to send up to you to operate <laughs> these things. So bear that in mind. Small grant scheme. Um, <laughs> Texas, do you want to come back on, on, on Neil's comment? <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. So um I had a couple of points actually. So in terms of money, um, the, the, the community-led marine biodiversity monitoring project does have an equipment fund um, which is available for application on a rolling basis at the moment. It's 1,500 per group or 3,000 if you are combining with another group um, as a kind of combined application. So the information for that is on the website. So that is something that you can potentially apply to if you're looking for your for your equipment. Um, in terms of what Nature Scott has, yeah, we do have actually um, some equipment picking about. We're kind of collating what that is and, and what that looks like. So um, do buzz me an email if that is something that you might be interested in kind of borrowing and I'll, I'll see what the scope is for that. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, the other thing that was in the top of my head now I've completely forgotten, I might remember late. <laughs> I'll pass on and I'll I'll put my hand up again if I remember. We'll we'll wait with eager anticipation. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. That that's great. Um, Lindsay. Hi. Um, I was seriously considering putting down a line for using the thereof, but I was just a bit worried about the um, legalities or sensibilities of doing it in a PMF area. Um, whether AI could be doing any damage dropping weights with lines and also whether I can get done for it. Um, so I, th I think a good uh, a good rule of thumb um, would be if the if the area that you're working in allows creeling then you're absolutely fine and you're not in terms of um, you're not going to do any more damage than they're already doing. So if if it's not if it's not an area that allows creeling, then you might need to be a little bit more careful. Um, but it you know we we do this stuff on coral reefs, which are an awful lot more you know sensitive than than um, than a lot of habit. You know if you if you drop this stuff into um, say like a a kelp bed then basically it's okay some of the times you end up with with kelp fronds coming up with the equipment and um, wh where were you thinking about doing it um well i won't be dropping the, the rod into a kelp bed i have enough trouble flying it through other things <laughs> um yeah it's just but we're mostly looking at seagrass areas um so it'd be crossing a seagrass bed so we can get a more accurate sort of estimate so I, I, th I think the issue there would be the, and I think, so yeah, the, the difficulty with the seagrass bed will be the fact that it's, it'll just hide, you know, it'll hide the, the rope. Um, there are probably better ways to survey the seagrass than, um, 
than with an ROV, I would suggest. People people suggested yesterday using, it depends how clear your water is, but um, using drones. Um, and uh, that, Daniel kindly hosted one of my uh, um, honours students uh, this year. Um, so if you if you can get yourself a student, you strap a GPS to them and send them off snorkeling, and they'll they'll map out the map out the seagrass bed. All you have to do is put them up for a while and well, try not to drown them if you don't mind. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm interested in the drone. Um, I'd like more information at some point. We're hoping somebody might do a talk about using drones for things like seagrass and the difficulties because obviously on the west coast here around sky the water is reasonably clear yeah yeah so I think ha hannah we we should yeah. maybe have a think about getting simon so there's a chap here simon gibson pool who has kind of specialized in that uh in that sort of stuff and um, so yeah we can certainly uh, we can certainly start and maybe get him involved and get him to to give a bit of a chat i think i think he get it, got in on the ground with as a, as a terrible kind of fun but he, i think he got in and on the ground with the use of of drones in over farmland and um, so it was a good sort of field surveying method so you know you he, he's used to having used ones that are like the size of the tip not the size of your desk um, and now he's down to you know stuff that's like this size yeah. um, can i make a quick comment um uh, Gavin, please yeah. regarding two things uh, one was um we've we've we're the fortunate position or unfortunate position we've got the no takes on which is the highest level of um mpa you can get so far um and we regularly use the rov in there um we try not to disturb the the um underlying um seabed but it's inevitable you will hit the seabed it's guaranteed um uh, so the minor incursions that you do are immaterial because the current will clear up any damage that you've you've done within half an hour. Um, that's point. The first point. The second point is um, putting an ROV into kelp. You've discovered, or you will discover, um, is a nightmare. Um, the same goes for seagrass. It's a nightmare. The worst thing of all is boot lace. Um, it wraps around the thrusters and just burns them out. I really recommend that you try and steer clear of trying to put it into anything that's relatively squidgy and um, and uh, incapable of snapping easily. Okay, thank you. That's my two comments. No, that that's great. Thank you, Gavin. And I think um, there's definitely, uh, I guess, desire for an ROV kind of wider conversation here because I think there's a lot of um, potential conversations about where and, and how it can be used. Um, as it comes to the drones, I think that that could be something as well to think about. I'm not sure if anyone else is. And there, there are probably more restrictions around drones, but if that's something people are interested in, I think there's expertise around and we can certainly provide some just to, if you want to have a geeky conversation, then we've definitely got some folk that can do that. Um, and uh, Texa, did you want to come in on, on these conversations? Yeah, I actually remembered one of the things I was going to say, <laughs> of course. Um, so the on the other point of just the general equipment uh, discussion that we just had, um, there is also at the moment a kind of community equipment um, list where essentially people can pop on what they have and if they are willing to share that equipment with other people. Um, obviously, there's absolutely no obligation to share, and they don't have you don't have to fill the the, the list in. Um, but that is kind of ongoing. I I will find a link to it and see where we're at with it, um, which might be helpful for people to know what equipment is out there. Um, and in terms of kind of um, what we're talking about, kind of I suppose the potential impacts of of doing work on a particular habitat. So 
a couple of things just to to keep in mind and that there are certain situations that do require some kind of license and um, particularly if you're kind of putting moorings or or, or kind of more slightly semi-permanent structures on the seabed and that's usually a current estate um, affair so you need to have a wee look into that um, and there are sometimes um, questions about certain things around um, certainly uh, particular survey types in marine protected areas um, so there are discussions about that I'm not I, I think it is a quite a grey area to be honest and I think that it's not there's nothing no restrictions as as such um, but it is worth having these discussions with them um, certainly the statutory bodies like nature scott just to make sure um everything's on the right side um so yeah that was just two points on that yeah and i sorry i could just add from our experience Thanks. last summer we weren't really sure either so all we did was yeah just quickly touch base with our local nature scott officer kind of outlined what we were doing she had a you know consideration of it and said yeah that's all sounds fine and it was a quick check and then we knew we were sort of had you know ticked those boxes and covered what we needed to do so that's great that's a, a great bit of advice thank you um so just want to open up more on the conversation about i guess equipment and setups and what people are using and and how and if there are any other challenges you're hitting um i'm not gonna throw you under the rov here but vanessa i think you and Martin had a question about your, your kind of rig. Is there something you, you thought would be useful to kind of bring up here? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, we're, I mean, we're a different situation because we're doing um, diving surveys. So we've started out with sea search when we were taking photos and things, and then we were lucky enough to get hold of a GoPro with a waterproof casing, and we've been using that to take informal videos and things like that. But we were kind of feeling the next stage with some of the some of the different projects and work that we've been doing is to try and and set up underwater transects and do video transects and things. And we've got some information about using setting up um, a kind of a frame with a GoPro as as that's one method. Um, but we were also wondering for using our camera video, just we've got um, a normal camera in a, in a housing um, and rigging it up with um, lasers. We were lucky enough to be given by somebody that we know in the diving community, gave us a couple of underwater laser pointers for then getting, gauging the, the distances to trying to get scale. And so we've gone as far as make a kind of little wooden rig that's 50 centimetres long with the, with the lasers on each side and the uh, part of Martin has, has made us all with, with the camera in the middle um, to start to kind of try and use that to kind of get a more accurate transect so that we can kind of work along a particular um, distance. Um, but we're really much newbies at this and the um at the moment we're not sure we, we've got a neighbor that can do amazing things in metal and we were hoping eventually that we might be able to get him to make us some kind of a rig for it but i wondered if there were any standard you know it could maybe a good place to look for um uh references for how to go about doing this um for actually making something or whether it is a case of you make something for your particular needs <laughs> So transects just in general, just on a, a quick point as well about we because we um, are trying to do um, survey, particularly fireworks and anemones in a particular area where we have a long term monitoring site and there we're trying to um, gauge abundance and set up something a bit more um, accurate in terms of having transects and doing counts and that kind of thing. Um, but the first thing is setting up a transect. There's so many fireworks and anemones that if you put a line across, we're worried about disturbing them. So it kind of goes back to what you were saying previously about disturbance to what you're trying to survey and whether or not in the long term it's really going to affect them by, by having this line. But just pulling this line up and down with all the tentacles and everything is quite challenging. Um, so, but the idea is, is that we can somehow get to try and get a straight line transect and get an actual, a decent count that's more than just us swimming across in a line on a bearing and taking a count from whatever we can see to something a little bit more 
um, organised. So that's that's essentially in a nutshell what we have and, and what what we're trying to do. So I don't know um, if that's you know if there's somewhere we can we can look for information about help for that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I, th I, th I think science has probably got got the answers that you that you need for that. So your lasers, um, I. So we use a similar. I don't know if you've maybe seen. You've maybe seen them advertised. The um, there are a, a a brand of dive torches called pa Paralens. I don't know whether I think they still they still make them. There's a bit of there's a bit of moving about. They're sort of they're sort of shaped like a little torch, um, and they worked quite nicely for um, they worked quite nicely for a, a stereo camera rig. That, that we built for surveys in uh, on Egyptian um, Red Sea uh, reef. So you can get pipe holders. So the same thing should work for you. I, I take it your lasers are like kind of about yay lot and circular. Yeah, they're just like little pen lasers. <clears throat> yeah. Muscle. So um, if you were to get you get a carbon fiber if you want to go high tech you get a carbon fiber tube um off off the internet They're, it's not massively cheap but the good thing about it is it will not change um dimensions in depending on what temperature the water is so if you've got a, a black tube sitting out in the um in the, the heat of a scottish summer on a boat deck and then you dump jump dump it in the water it will ch it will change it size the, the carbon fiber won't move as much um, and you could attach your lasers to that just with um, kind of pipe hangers um, so that that might be a kind of spot and then mount the camera in the middle of it and you've you've got a, um, a, a mount that you can that you can use um, for the anemones I would just I would suggest probably a um, a quadrat sample would be more appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so again, for reefs, what we what we'll do. Um, I don't know if I've got a. Um, yeah. So let me just share. Let me just share my screen. Um, so we did. Uh, I think I don't think it's in. It's not in present. It's not in a uh, full presenter view, but there was we we were working on these real weird reefs in the Caribbean, um, where it's all just soft, but it's all soft sponges, it's not not a massive amount of coral. Um, so transect tape laid out, um, and you can get coral point count. It's called. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a bit of a, it's a bit of a. Um, convoluted process to get it. So I think it's I think it's Nova University in uh, in the states in Florida that uh, make and supply it. So the the shortened acronym um, shortened acronym for it is CPC, <coughs> Coral Point Count. Um, and all you actually need to do is as long as you work out somewhere, it doesn't need to be on the um, on on. Uh, the actual bit of uh, reef that you're working on or or whatever you're working on as long as you make sure that you will end up with a square box then all you need to do is put a, a transect tape down or we, we managed to put this on around the sides of uh, of reefs um coral point count will draw you the the box around about it so you just tell it the distance from here to here is 20 centimetres. It will draw the quadrat and then it will give you a set of points across the quadrat. And all you need to do is say whether your species is there or not there. Obviously, it's designed for coral, but the, the easiest thing to do is just, just pick a, a common coral. So there's there's a brain coral, for example, so it'll have a code for that. You could use that for one of your species. We can work together if you want to change to change that, um, and that will give you a percentage cover of whatever species that you that you want to to use. 
um, what kind of visibility in the water do you need to use this? Um, anything it doesn't matter as long as you can see it. Yeah, it's not. Obviously it sounds see. all. Yeah, it sounds all very computery. Is is not at all. It's it's all um, mark one eyeball. So yeah, you are. Uh, you're. Um, you're pinpointing what it is. All it's doing is giving you a random set of points or a systematic set of mm -hmm. points, whatever you whatever you right. choose. Mm -hmm. You can also ask uh, Chat GTP to do that for you as well if you want to count the stuff. So you can just ask it to give you a set of points across that across an image. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> might be worth uh, doing some kind of little look into uh, AIS, uh, AIS? Um, AI <laughs> um, situation to help with community data. I mean, it, it's it's obviously it's a powerful tool. I know nothing about it, um, so that could be quite interesting. Hey, thanks. That's yeah, yeah. There's quite a lot to think about. There. Um. As Neil said, you can send around some links and things after this. So very happy to kind of provide some information, then people can take it away and come back if you have any questions or anything you'd like to follow up on. Because it's a lot to digest, a lot of conversation right now. So um, I am aware. I was I'm aware for starters, I was going to give you a break part way through, and we didn't do that because we were just powering through on conversations about. Uh, data and marine stuff so hopefully that's okay I will try and then finish a little bit early so you're, you're not um, just sitting for two hours solidly but uh, very happy to keep talking about kit um, the other thing I kind of wanted to touch on was uh, what people are doing with your data or what you'd like to do with your data um, and how you're kind of managing it uh, any questions around that I know last night a lot of people were saying that you send your data to C-Search and then it kind of goes off to them for validation. Um, I'm just interested in kind of any ways that you found that you're managing it well or that you feel like you'd like more knowledge or support around what to do with it. Um, any kind of comments, suggestions, thoughts? Claire, hey. Um, no, I was just going to say one of the things that we also do, which I kind of forgot to mention because I'm not quite sure how um, important it is here, but we also do some monitoring for invasive um, non-native species, um, specifically in kind of marinas where we can drop um, kind of corex plastic panels um, just to kind of, and we put them in at the beginning of the summer down to about a metre and then take them back out at the end of the summer and monitor and just assess and try and see what's there. And it's mostly just kind of presence, absence and a bit of kind of abundance. But we pass all that information on to our local record centre who are, are really happy to have it because they don't have an awful lot of marine data. And I think a lot of local record centres are very much focused on kind of terrestrial records. But also we pass it on to um, NMPI, um, National Marine Plan Interactive, because they quite like to have those records as well. And I usually pass them on to somebody in SEPA, um, although I don't know how much um, actual record storing and data storing they do, and also Nature Scott. But I don't know whether there's any other kind of sources that would find those kind of useful as well. That's fantastic. That sounds like you're... you're um spreading them to all the places I would suggest actually uh, and I think if a lot of local record centers I think the last estimate was that less than five percent of the data and records they have are marine so actually you're doing a you know every record has impact I think um, in the marine environment there so that that's fantastic Texa do you have any other suggestions of places for particularly for invasive species data um, or do you think that's that's kind of covering it that <laughs> um, invasive species data. So um, basically, what what we're doing at Nature Scott it, it, with all data essentially is moving it onto the GNCC new marine recorder, um, which is a, a new kind of um, look marine recorder, which existed before, but, but now it's been updated. Um, so that is where we are. We're hoping to, to kind of put 
what the previous records that we've got and then um, put stuff moving forward. So the idea is that once it passes into my recorder, it can then um, pass onto the relevant database and that might be gems for PMFs, um, other, other aspects. What it doesn't do at the moment is really capture uh, restoration data. It doesn't really, I don't think it captures in data, so invasive species. So there's definitely things that need worked on there. Um, and regarding ins, I think I'm not entirely sure. I need to double check where um, that could be sent within Nature Scott. Certainly, we have a an invasive, you know, team who are, who are very qualified in that. As do marine director, they're obviously always interested in marine invasives. So um, we're thinking about communicating with folk there, especially if you've got ID questions, and um, they're all quite keen to to help out with that. Um, and that's going to be a really important aspect of what we're all doing probably going forward with marine invasives really is going to be um, an up and coming kind of probably struggle that we're, we're going to be facing as our waters change with uh, with climate change. So um, just worth thinking about. That's great. Thank you. I think that's that's really helpful. Um, Lindsay. Yeah, hi, it's a, I suppose a question for Texa really. Um, as you know, we've been trying to get our data onto the, we've, we've been filling in the big spreadsheets and trying to get the data on, but obviously there's a struggle to, for that to happen. If the system's changing to the new marine recorder, is there any point carrying on filling in the spreadsheets? I think is my question, because they take quite a while to fill in. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate that. So basically, um, we do need the data in the format of the sheets to pass on to the recorder because all that data is kind of transcribed over. Um, there, while we're we're it's all a working situation with Marine Recorder right now. I'm not on the Marine Recorder development team. Um, so what the situation is currently is that there are people who are um, kind of verified uh, data enters who can then enter data onto the platform. Um, at the moment, we don't have community groups who are community data enters. We don't have that. Um, that might be something that we can do in the future. The only um, kind of caveat associated with that would be that the data would need to be kind of um, verified, QA'd and all that before it passed into my recorder, which is not necessarily, you know, an issue as long as that did happen. So it's all kind of moving um, in, in a process at the moment. Um, Lindsay, your data currently, we, we're a lot of it is already in my recorder, which is excellent. Um, Ed Thompson is actually the data um, manager for a lot of the data that comes through the project, which is brilliant. So he's been working really hard on that. Um, ideally, then that um, passes on to an MPI and then on to GEMS as well. So it's it's that staged process. But um, we're working through this as well. This is a it's all in a kind of this is all quite new territory and we're trying to work out what systems work best and what how to find our feet with especially you know communicating between all the different data sources and we're passing them on so just um always you know give us your feedback let us know what challenges you've got especially with the data sheets and know that there are challenges there so I'm, i am working on um kind of trying to improve that but yeah just keep an open dialogue we're, we're really um, interested in, and need to be uh, driven by what your needs are. So, okay, so carry on with the carry on with the sheets. If so. you can, yes. <laughs> probably not what you want to hear right now, but yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's just a general point as well, because when we're trying to find out what records exist, um, say around sky, seagrass records, and that, it's just really difficult because there were just there just seem to be so many different places. And all, all the databases that you look at seem to have different records on them. It's so I don't know, maybe again, as part of the training things, there could be something as to where all the data bases are and how the data flows. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely something we're, we're kind of hoping to to put together because I think that is a that's a really important aspect of it all if you in the meantime while we're kind of like you know it, while data is catching up with itself because it does seem to move between you know it has a process if you are um, looking for the most up-to-date kind of 
say for a PMF, for example, I can I can get a map for you of a particular location that, that hopefully has the most up to date records that we have. Um, and that's probably one of the, the, the you know, accessible ways to do that. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be able to do that for the whole of Scotland, but certainly if you've got an area of interest, you just pop me an email and I'll see what I can do with uh, most recent records. Does my spot mainly use the NMPI or? Yeah, so the NMPI should should be fairly up to date, but as I as as with many things, there is obviously a backlog um, of of data being passed on to that. So um, some things might be on gems that aren't on MPI, vice versa. But um, we'll do our best. I mean, it's all <laughs> it's big big data repositories, and there's really big challenges associated with kind of managing it all. But we we're you know it, uh, we will get there. It's just a work in progress. Right, OK, thank you. Because, I mean, even a couple of weeks ago, I found another database, some botanical one where people have been recording seagrass on. So it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of data out there, but it's just getting hold of it all and knowing where to look. Really. Yeah, one, one giant database for everything would be <laughs> ideal. <laughs> Neil, did you have a something you wanted to say there as well? Yeah, sorry. Just I was just going to say the the NMPI map um, is is a good good starting point for a, like a broad overview. Um, it can be a bit of a pain to to navigate some of the different headings, but yeah, when, once you dig down through that, it's that that would tend to be where I would go to for the first port of call to get a nice broad overview of where stuff is, you know, kind of na nationwide. I guess there. Are particular challenges around seagrass as you say because it kind of people it falls into people's different categories um i'm not sure if any i'm going to just wander around our seagrass uh, focused experts here and ask if there's any any other sources for seagrass data that you'd be looking at or is that is the interest still fairly new i'm going to take that as a no <laughs> uh, lindsay did you have a Something that you could add. Um, I'd just say seagrass spotter is great for finding seagrass all around everywhere. So it's very easy to load the data and very easy to see see where records are and drill down into them. So so that's obviously I'm going to say relatively new um, and very focused. Is there are there any other types of insert species spotter or very specific databases or sites that anyone's using for anything or is it seagrass is, is the main i don't know of any i'm just interested if anyone else has any that they're using no? okay good to kind of check that out um so i kind of we've, we've got maybe 10 minutes left before i want to let everyone go so this is a an open space to be able to ask any more questions that you feel you have but um i also particularly for our benefit wanted to ask anyone anything that's a barrier to you doing this so whether that's equipment costs i think we touched on that whether that's access to data access to expertise lack of training is there anything that would assist you moving forward with the monitoring you want to do um this is for us to kind of it's not we can't promise everything but we can just start to to gather these things together and see what can be done uh, katie Hi, yeah, um, this isn't necessarily a barrier as such. It's just something that I'm wondering if other groups can advise about. Um, and I've approached text about this before as well. Um, so it would just be quite good to see if anyone's got any recommendations. Um, we've been quite lucky to get some funding for some higher value equipment. Um, and as our sort of like collection of equipment grows, we're wanting to get it insured. Um, so I wondered if anyone here on the call, like with higher value equipment particularly like ROVs because I can imagine they're quite expensive um, whether anyone has experience with specific um, insurance or if they can recommend any um, sp specific companies that would be really helpful because it just at the moment seems like a bit of a, a minefield <laughs> thanks no that that's a great question does anyone does anyone insure their ROVs I'm going to look at Gavin a little bit and say that you might have we we do it's sure just ours, under, unfortunately no, it's our no. admin person who does that so i couldn't tell okay. you anything but i could find out for people but yeah 
Yeah, equally the same. It's just under the, the uh, Discovery Centre insurance um, as equipment. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering because we're a charity, charitable organisation, how we can kind of integrate that into what we've got in place already. But no, that's good to know. Well, Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll get the information and uh, pass it on to Texa. Wonderful. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erica and Gavin. That's really helpful. Um, and good questions, exactly the kind of questions it's really useful to have other people's input on and, and share. So keep these kind of things coming. Um, Lindsay, do you have a question as well? Comment? Um, yeah, comment on the last one. We don't insure our ROV. And then my next question was also about insurance. And that's more for what our liability is if we try and get volunteers to come out with us to do these sort of surveys. Um, just as a bit of background, we used to be part of a a charity that was terrestrial marine and we were unable to get any insurance whatsoever even to cover just the terrestrial bit because we did marine activities and nobody, nobody would insure us for doing anything marine so um, we're just a bit worried about trying to recruit people to come out and do things like snorkeling and kayaking and and then we end up liable if there's an accident so I've sort of brought this up we sort lots of people and there doesn't just doesn't seem to be an answer but I think there must be lots of groups out there that are either uninsured or maybe think they're insured but aren't <laughs> so I, I think it'd be good if there was something through the sort of the network to at least let us know what we should or shouldn't be doing just to cover ourselves because I I think even if you get sort of disclaimer signed, people say they're not, they don't really have much legal standing. So, yeah, and I think there's a lot of grey area still around citizen science and where you sit as in terms of being liable and volunteers. So I think that's a really, it's a really good point, um, particularly in the mere environment. I'm not sure I have a, a really good answer to it. I don't, I don't think it really has, but it, it, yeah. it certainly for us is a barrier to going out and and trying to get people involved. So. Um, does anyone have any, is, any, is anyone cracked to this? Is anyone doing anything that they would be willing or happy to share? Or is this a problem that a lot of people are facing or potentially thinking about? Um, Hannah, can I say something? Please, Danny. Um, we, we, uh, it's something we grapple with all the time with the health and safety and insurance. Um, and and one of the things that we've done is with BSAC, we've developed an underwater surveyor course. Um, and if you go to the BSAC website you, you and put in underwater surveyor course, you can, uh, you, it, it's a practical course and it's an online course. Um, and, and the reason why we did that was to try and um, get some level of qualification for some of the volunteer snorkelers that we were working with. Um, simply for sort of um, HSE reasons, and so, but that might be something that some of the people on this course might be, might look into, and because uh, I think it's it's worth doing for multiple reasons. And do you feel that's helped your kind of liability essentially because you've you've got people to a certain level of expertise? Is that is that the reason it was done or is that a benefit? Yes, um, that was the reason why we did it. Um, and there was, I mean, BSAC, BSAC, we took some advice from BSAC and they reckoned that by developing this course and by having this qualification, um, it would help us should there be a, um, you know, an incident. Um, so that's that's a requirement that we, that, that we, all our volunteers who consistently work with us to do snorkel, um, snorkel surveying now have to take that course so we just it 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 just it sort of gives us some level of um of expertise that we can point to excellent i think that's that's really helpful and is that is that used more widely beyond your volunteers to BSAC use it for others or is this going to be rolled out it's only just been launched um okay. and it was launched about a month ago um and um so if if you I, I don't think you have to be a BSAC member to take the course, but there is a fee. I think it's about £25, something like that. Um, but it's it's BSAC recognised. OK, that's great. Thank you. Um, I've... 
Sorry, I'm just going to. I just had to. So there, there's a whole yeah. There's a whole range of of online BSAC materials for um like just the snorkeling skills. So it'll teach duck diving, mask clearing, and stuff like that. So it's quite you know it's quite a useful resource. So even if somebody um it isn't necessarily a member of BSAC, I, th I think they can download them. Um, there is another dive agency also called Raid who all of the material is free whether they do whether they do an online uh snorkeling version it's also quite similar there's a there's a few kind of weird divey things about uh about the raid stuff but it's quite a good resource if people are looking for um give, giving people sort of an introduction to just the activity of snorkeling and the, you know and then move forward to uh, to the to the serve framework Brilliant. I wonder if again there's scope for just sharing some of these um, links and resources that might be helpful. Um, Lindsay, is that a legacy hand, or do you have a, something you want to bring back? Uh, that's a legacy hand. <laughs> that's absolutely fine. Um, okay. Quite cognizant of time, so are there any? last comments, thoughts or questions while we're here together. Um, I think this has been really useful having people's input and, and expertise here. So I've certainly found it really interesting. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about um, or mention or question, Erica? Um, yeah, I think I guess maybe one thing that we certainly also struggled with this year was actually trying to involve the community more. Um, so it's just really wondering what's worked for other people. Um, you know, we because obviously being in St. Abs, we're a super popular dive site. Um, so we tried putting posters on all the dive boats and all the local dive shops and even dive shops from further afield that come to St. Abs and um, with the hopes that they would kind of help us with some of our, our like looking for horse muscles and stuff. And all the all those people were like very happy to take our posters, but we didn't have a single diver you know, report a sighting other than Charlotte, who's in this conversation, who was part of the project anyway. Um, you know, so we were kind of a bit sort of disappointed that that kind of didn't really go anywhere. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what's kind of what other people have found have worked. <laughs> so the the classic question about volunteer engagement and retention, I guess. Um, yeah. Texa, was there a, something you want to say about that? Yeah, I just I just want to raise that it's not just um you know it's not on an individual basis that this is a struggle and it's right across Scotland, the UK and beyond. It really um seems to be a bit of a fallout from the COVID impact that people are really struggling to find the time and capacity to volunteer, and that's really tough when you're trying to run a, a kind of community group with volunteers. Um, it's I, I don't have an answer to it, but I just wanted to kind of, you know, say that it isn't is it's not just you. <laughs> Essentially, everyone's having this issue. Um, I think that maintaining your good connections and and offering opportunities that are are possibly less time consuming as well for people to get involved in could be a way to get you know just get that momentum built up. But it is really tricky, and I. I, I I totally understand where you're coming from there because it's a, it's a really hard one, um, but everyone is is having a, a bad time with it at the moment. Yeah, I I, I totally think that's fair. And I'm sorry we don't have an answer for you. This might be more sympathy than uh, actual answers, but but I think that is recognised across the board, whether that's citizen science or whether that's kind of community councils or anything that, that we're having a bit of a volunteering crisis. So, um, does anyone have any any brilliant answers for that or? <laughs> the the silence on, on I think, speaks volumes. <laughs> That's a very academic answer, Neil. I love it. Um, but, but but we are on. You, no, you do. You do. On you go. No, no. I I, I was gonna I was gonna do the plug that maybe the, that you were gonna do in that. Um, so you know we're a higher education organisation. We have undergraduate students, masters students. Uh, I've got master students coming out of my ears looking for projects, and they're looking for. Uh, projects they really want to do projects with communities or to feel they've made a difference and some of them are genuinely brilliant um, and put a lot of work in so if what you'd like is some capacity to come and do some monitoring to look at your data to come up with an answer for you then 
speak to one of the universities around and make that connection what was really happy to basically farm out students in um for free in you know maybe it maybe bed board and occasional burger is, is all they really need so was that what you're going to say neil or if i if i it, exact, exactly yeah and and don't feel bad about coming to us either if uh you know if you want referring to other you know un, un, other sets of institutions as well quite happy to to um you know su suggest that oh st andrews might be better for that or glasgow might be better for that and, you know the, it's um you know so it's all for the for the sort of greater good so yeah absolutely mo we're more than happy to um, make suggestions from that point of view yeah we're all secretly friends underneath um gregor thanks my, my question was up there earlier um it, my, very much low tech end of the spectrum which might answer some of those questions about volunteers um i was looking when i've started this role um for what i would just call a, a bucket with a glass bottom um jane corrected me it's got a name bathy scope um, i'm surprised that hasn't come up um certainly i'm running something for kids in i think but it warms up a bit anyway um according to parents and just a, a, you know a, a glass bottom bucket would seem to me a good toe in the water or head in the water type of thing i know it's not well it's not super scientific but i noticed in the um book that people scientists often use them anybody experience it i found a very cheap one on amazon so i'll buy a few of them for the kids and see how they go um but there's obviously more technical things like everything um but you get what you pay for don't you Uh, Neil, bucket with a glass bottom comments. I think is is where we're going here. It's, it's just a it's just a slightly smaller glass bottom boat. So it sounds pretty. It sounds pretty technical. No, I mean it's it's absolutely perfect. The the problem with all the shiny tech is it's really shiny, but it's also like liable to to breakage every five seconds so yeah you you will gather more to, if you know if, if your site is accessible with um so say you're you're mapping um some shallows um then if it's accessible with a bucket with a glass bottom in it then um you are probably much much better using that than um, and say an ROV. Quite a lot of my uh, students have wanted to map areas of of uh, seagrass, as as um, Danny knows. Um, some of them have been doing that on um, more um, so far, further up the shoreline, and you know, desperate to do it with with say like a, um, a drone or something like that. And actually, their best bet is to walk around the thing holding a GPS because you know. It's proven tech, and and it'll last all day. And um, you know, if you give them a Snickers, they'll keep going. The the um, the drone runs out of battery much quicker. So yeah, no, I'm I'm all in favour of if if you want to use a really technical piece of equipment, I think you need a really really good reason to want to do it. Mark, mark one eyeballs usually usually work the best. We don't only use young people for slave labour, but it does help, I think, is the other message there. Um, Gavin, did you have a, a comment or a question? It was just a, a comment on the last two things. Um, first one is, uh, <laughs> Neil's right, equipment breaks frequently. Um, a, and we also use the bucket with a glass bottom. And we use them um, for school children um, to look into rock pools uh you know they're, they're really useful for that um and uh, a drop down pole for up to about five meters um or a, a, a gopro and a long pole that you can stick out into the into the water is also useful with a leaky feed onto a tab uh, you have a, a, a tablet you can uh, show and and move around so that's actually quite useful for something that's Probably up to about maybe seven meters, maybe eight meters if you're lucky, before it starts bending too much. But if you can get it onto a plastic pole, um, then uh, that works as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I like that 
this conversation starts with high tech ROVs and ends with buckets and children, which is kind of where where we all come to in the end when it comes to this kind of monitoring. Right. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to have to wrap it up there because we're, we're running out of time and aware that people want to go and have your your tea or your gin or whatever it is that you're going to need at five o'clock on a, on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, I wanted to say thank you very much to everybody for coming. It only works when you're so excellent at participating and asking questions and sharing ideas. So it's hugely appreciated that you've done this. Um, we hope that there's been some useful hints or tips there. Obviously, this has been quite unstructured, so it's really just to kind of see where the conversation takes us. But as I said, if there's anything you think of that would be useful going forward, then talk to Texter and she'll collate some of these ideas and, and hopefully we can try and support communities doing this kind of thing. Um, whatever it is you you want to do we, we really want to try and support you and i'm going to hand over to texa just for the end um for any kind of final comments or, or feedback on on these couple of sessions thanks hannah yeah that's that's been really great everyone and thank you so much for your input as hannah said it only works if everyone kind of um, brings comments questions and, and thoughts and everything else so um i am going to uh, Bring together all of the all of the things that have been talked about there's some really 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 good ideas for training going forward there's some good ideas for uh, potentially things that we can do to help ease processes or provide structure or, or places for things to go so there's lots of things that i am going to be thinking about going forward um the recordings i intend to just put onto the website so if there is anything in there that you want to refer back to they should be available for you um so yeah thank you so much and again ping us emails if you've got further questions or comments um please do just get in touch and um, yeah thank you so much and i hope you have a good rest of the day really love to meet you everybody thank you so much thanks thank bye. you thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.